Bill Schutt is a professor of biology at LIU Post and a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. He is the author of Dark Banquet, Blood and the Curious Lives of the Blood-Feeding Creatures, and Pump, A Natural History of the Heart, which is his latest book, I believe. Professor Schutt also co-authored two novels, Hell's Gate and the Himalayan Codex. In 2017, Professor Schutt published an astonishing book called Cannibalism, a perfectly natural history that I have right here, which is what we're going to be discussing today, in which, honestly, I couldn't put down once I started reading it. It's so compelling. I believe I devoured it, um, no pun intended, in two days, which never happens to me unless I'm reading one of Stalin's biographies. Anyway, right. Professor Schott, welcome to Eurotrash. Nice to be here. Out of all the dark taboos out there, I always thought that cannibalism was the most straightforward one uh, with things like, let's say, murder or even incest or something. Yes, we have a visceral reaction to them, but cannibalism just comes equipped with this universal stop sign that seems older than, than time itself as something that holds true across time and space and is completely non-negotiable in any context. And since it seems so unambiguous, I thought there's not really all that much interesting we could say about it. And then I read your book and boy, oh boy, was I wrong because this stuff is complex uh, to say the least. And there's many layers to it. The first one that already shocked me, to be honest, uh, was the fact that within the animal kingdom, we find cannibalism practically among all species, pretty much across the board, right? Well, I don't know about all species, but all all animal groups. Yeah, and it, okay. It's, you know, it's, more, it's more common in some than it is in others. For example, animals without backbones, the invertebrates, it's very, very common. Uh, and then once you get into, you know, on, on sort of the other side of the spectrum, once you get into the mammals, it's less common. Uh, and then primates, not so common. Um, so, but but it is really widespread. You're right about that. and And that was a big surprise to me as well. So from what I understand, cannibalism in the animal kingdom fulfills an evolutionary function. Could you explain that aspect a bit more? Yeah, I, I think, so let me back up a bit. When, when I first started working on this book, uh, um, I'm, I noticed that, that most of the uh, uh, mentions of cannibalism in the animal kingdom had to do with, uh, with, with two things. It was, it, you know, it was... Um, you know, it was either weirdo animals like uh, like praying mantises or, or black widow spiders who, who who were cannibalizing each other, um, or it was animals that were stressed out. Um, for example, uh, golden hamsters, which are a po very popular pet, um, cannibalizing their their young, and and because of the, the reason that they're doing this is because they're sort of stuffed in small cages and they're stressed out by by these captive conditions, and so that was. That was really uh, the party line for a, a long time among among researchers was that if, if you're going to get cannibalism, this is this is where you would see it. Um, and and when I started to to do the work, the background work on this, I realized that that there were scientists who had since the 1970s uh, published papers you know, that showing that cannibalism was widespread for, for other reasons that had nothing to do with, you know, a lack of food or, 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 or stressful conditions or, 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 you know, the fact that they were praying mantises or, or, or black widows. But, but I found cannibalism related to things like parental care or, um, you know, as a lifeboat strategy um, where you have, for example, um, three chicks hatch uh, we're talking birds, of course, and and two of them are larger than than the third because they are they they hatch earlier and and they're also you know internally they, they get this sort of internal boost of hormones that the third chick doesn't and if there's plenty of food then there's no problems but if if for example there's a there's a, a lack of food uh, then the, the the two larger chicks will will oftentimes cannibalize the smaller one. So this this went on and on, and there were all sorts of other reasons. For example, um, you know, one of my favorites was when I went out to to Arizona and and studied these spade foot toads, and and here was an example where the the unpredictable environmental conditions selected for the, the this cannibalistic morph um, sort of body type 
in, in roughly half of the tadpoles that hatched in these ponds that were transient ponds. They could, the, the conditions out there were, were really, really warm and dry or, or hot and dry. And, and these ponds that the eggs are laid in by the, by the toads can evaporate overnight. And so in, in essence, if the, if the toad, if, if the eggs haven't hatched into tadpoles and then evolved and then sort of developed into uh, toadlets that can sort of get out of the pool and, and, and hop away before the pond dries out, then everybody dies. So what has evolved um, is, is this, are these cannibal morphs where, where half of this batch of eggs, you know, they all hatch into tadpoles. They all look the same, but within a couple of days, half of the tadpoles are tremendously larger with these big jaw, jaws and, 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 a, and a short meat eating sort of digestive system. And there are all these other uh, sort of adaptations that, the, that they develop really quickly and they cannibalize the smaller tadpoles hatched out of the same batch of eggs, which enables them to develop quicker and get out of the pond um, before it could possibly uh, um, evaporate. So those are the types of things that, that I ran into when I was working on this book that, that, you know, that just blew me away. And there were more, there were, there were several other reasons right. why cannibalism in nature. I have to say one of the most horrifying instances of animal cannibalism that you describe in the book was that of the tiger sharks. Apparently, once they're in the womb, their embryos develop at different times or something. Um, but that's not the scary part. The scary part is the bigger baby sharks who already have teeth somehow then proceed to eat the smaller ones all while still inside the womb. So they will eat yeah, each other. Really until... Yeah. So, so think of it this way. So instead of it, they hatch from eggs, but instead of eggs being laid like we usually think of them and you know, the eggs are external, the, the eggs are maintained inside the mother. And there are two oviducts, a right and a left. And, and there are eggs that develop at different rates within that oviduct. The ones that are the oldest eggs, and there's one on the right side and one on the left side, um, they hatch internally and begin devouring the smaller eggs. And when those, if some of those eggs are still around and they hatch, then, then those two sharks, right side and left side, devour the smaller sharks. And, and in essence, basically what happens is when they are delivered, when, 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 when they leave the, their mother, they are already trained to be hunters. So this is the selective advantage that they have out in this, you know, wild and difficult world that they're going to encounter. Uh, yeah, that that is a uh, th that's that's another really strange example of sort of I think the term for that would be filial cannibalism. All right. And um, the second case that made, made my hair stand up a little bit was that of Sicilians. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but these sort of snaky yeah. worms eating the skin of their mothers as babies. And then that skin grows back and she kind of she's motionless while her babies are eating her. Yeah, this was a, a another pretty. I mean, damn. Yeah, the, the, these are these are actually amphibians, so they're sort of closely related to things like salamanders and frogs, but they're legless and they look like you know they look like an eel or a snake um, or or a large worm, and they're found in the tropics in South America and also in Africa, and there are two very different types. Some of them lay eggs, and some of them have live births. So the 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 embryos develop inside the mother rather than, than an egg being hatched. The ones that you're talking about, the egg layers, there were films that, that people looked at that showed, um, that, that, that showed the babies after they hatch sort of squirming around their mothers. And when years later, when people took a closer look at those videos, what they realized was that, was that, that the mothers, which had grown sort of abnormally fat, and, and the, their outer layer of skin suddenly developed a lot of fat content, which no one knew really why that happened. What these babies were doing is sort of latching on to their epidermis, to the outer layer of skin and pulling it off and eating it. Um, and and so, so, so that was one example of sort of maternal cannibalism, parental care uh, type of cannibalism. Years later, what they found was that the, 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 groups of Sicilians that that give birth to live young, as the babies develop internally, 
the fat doesn't uh, on the mother doesn't doesn't accumulate on the outside of its body, but along the oviduct, along the you know the sort of the, the uterine tract, um, and the babies are are eating that fat rich lining of the uh, of, of the mother's reproductive system, so that when they when they hatch, um, they're able to have already had a meal. So in both instances, in egg layers and in in live bearing uh, Sicilians, they have this incredibly strange maternal cannibalism. It's such an oxymoron, the phrase paternal care cannibalism. <laughs> um, it, they lose a lot of weight too. The mothers, you know, they don't go through this unscathed, but, um, you know, they, they do survive. Uh, by the way, are there some commonalities that we can draw from, from cannibalism in the animal world? Why does that happen? I mean, there, like I mentioned before, I mean, there's cannibalism that, that for a number of different reasons, and 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 some of them are quite different. So, for example, if you get into animals like bears and tigers and lions, if there is a a, a female who comes into the group and she has a uh, and she has a, a for example a cub, um, then it often pays for the lead male in that group to kill and cannibalize that cub so that the female comes into estrus and is more receptive to mating quicker. So you get rid of that paternal investment uh, and, the, and now you can mate with that female. So that there are all sorts of different reasons why this happens. And, and, and a lot of times across the animal groups, you'll see similarities in the invertebrates, for example, um, or even in fish. Let's, 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 let's talk about fish for a minute. Yeah. Um, if you're laying 5 million eggs, if you're a codfish, then, then, then those eggs are, are, you know, it's not like there's Tony and then, you know, there's Sally over there. It, it, think of it more like these are raisins. Uh, this is indiscriminate cannibalism. Here is a safe, um, you know, here's a safe, easy to access food source uh, that, that these, that many species of fish take advantage of uh, because they're not really putting a dent in the massive numbers of eggs that are out there, uh, very few of which are ever going to become adults anyway. Um, but but this is something that that crosses many species of, of of fish where you get you know indiscriminate cannibalism. If you're laying thousands of eggs, then it doesn't really matter if a couple of them right. get eaten or you know a hundred of them even. All right. If we put Neanderthals aside, you begin the story of human cannibalism with Christopher Columbus, and mm -hmm. there's a very good, if dark, reason for that. Could you break down that that story for us a little bit? Well, I think if, if you back up, the cannibalism in humans evolved a, a long time before Christopher Columbus. Of course. But, yeah, but but I, in the book, I talk about the fact that now what had already developed is this taboo, which we haven't talked about yet, how how the how cannibalism became this knee jerk reaction that we all have. When I say that word, you are completely you know, you're you're thinking about like Jeffrey Dahmer and, and what a horror show this is. But but that developed, you know, long before Christopher Columbus. But by the time these these sort of flag planters uh, made their way across the, the Atlantic, um, it was already a very well established taboo. And and it became what well, well, just to use the example of Columbus. So he gets to the New World and he meets these people, um, the, 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 you know, indigenous people in, in the Caribbean. And the initial word that goes back to uh, to uh, to, um, uh, to the queen um, is that, you know, these these they're nice people. They are, you know, and I'm, of course, I'm paraphrasing. These are these are nice people. They're 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 fit to become good Christians, and 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 that's what we'll do. Now now Columbus was looking for gold, uh, and and he didn't find any gold in the Caribbean. So when that took when when that sort of uh, came about, and he made four voyages, um, then 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 things changed, and going from looking for gold, and there was as I said very little of it, if any, um, he went he tried to find another resource, and 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 the most valuable resource that he found were humans. And so Queen Isabella had, and once again, paraphrasing, is, is, is that, you know, if, if, if the people that you encounter are, 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 are good people, then, then, then you need to treat them well. But if they're cannibals, you can do whatever you want, all bets are off. And so lo and behold, on his third and fourth journeys to the new world, you know, instead of these kind people that he met, they were all cannibals. So, so, so you could do whatever you wanted to them. You could destroy their civilization. 
You could murder them. You could enslave them. You could steal everything that they owned. And that's what he did. And the, and, and the Spaniards that followed him as well and other European groups did the same thing uh, in Mexico and Central America and South America and then in Africa. Uh, the, the, it was the same thing. If, if you could call someone a cannibal, then, then in reality, these journeys became sort of like a, you know, a, a eliminating pests uh, that you weren't dealing with humans. And, and this happened time and time again. So you dehumanize uh, uh, indigenous groups. Uh, and, and, you know, and the best way to do that is, to, is to, to, to call them cannibals. That's not to say that some cannibalism probably didn't occur in, uh, in these groups, because, you know, one of the themes of my book is that culture is king. And it's the, that, that's the major difference between humans and human cannibalism and animal cannibalism. And humans determine whether cannibalism is a, is, is a wonderful way to, to, to honor your dead uh, if you're the Ware in South America or the Four um, uh, in New Guinea, uh, or, uh, or if the, the very concept of, of consuming another human is, is horror, the worst thing that you can do. So it's just a matter of the fact that that the, in Western culture, and this started with the ancient Greeks, and then moved to the Romans, and then and then throughout Europe, um, that cannibalism was was literally the worst thing that you could do to another human being. And the only way that that that, that it would occur was if the gods were mad at you, or you were doing it in an extreme form, a form of vengeance. Um, so there was a big difference there in 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 cultures. So there are cultures where, at least there were, where cannibalism is a, a is, is something that is done to, to honor the dead, for example. If we go back um, to conquistadors and to Christopher Columbus, um, so like you said, they kind of weaponized this taboo against the local populations, right? Suddenly every local that was found resisting was proclaimed a cannibal practically. And a Absolutely. particularly striking story in this horrible saga is that of Trinidad that you describe in the book. The Spanish, of course, thought there was, there was lots of gold there. So the locals were designated as non-cannibals at first, since the Spaniards needed a proper workforce to mine. Once it turned out that there was no gold there, reports began filtering suddenly that the locals were cannibals after all. So it was kind of okay to start killing them again. Horrifying. Yeah, they basically depopulated that entire island, which is horrifying. Um, we talked about it uh, already right now. Where does the taboo of cannibalism, which here in the West, like you said, we regard as one of the worst there is, uh, if not the worst, where does it come from? It starts with, at, at least in Western culture, it started with the ancient yeah. Greeks. And, and, and so they were the, the ancient Greeks were, they were the ones who sort of determined that, that cannibalism was something that a good Greek would never do, that, 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 that the others did this, you know, which is very similar. The to barbarians. The yeah, the, the the barbarians, and this is the same line that that Columbus and the and the flag planters uh, used as well. Um, and from the the Greeks, it got passed on to the Romans, and and um, and from the Romans, uh, it spread throughout Europe. And so you had, um, a, you know, so so later on, it would be it would be Shakespeare, and it would be the Brothers Grimm, and and you had a snowball effect. Um, where cannibalism was thought of as really the worst thing that you could do. And, and, it, and then it entered into the early anthropologists, and they were expecting to find cannibals wherever they went. And, and so, uh, yeah, um, and, and it goes on and on. Uh, you, you had uh, Daniel Defoe with, uh, with, with, when, when he wrote um, Robinson Crusoe, just this idea that is ingrained in the Western brain that, that cannibalism is... It, it, is the the most serious taboo, uh, and and so that's where it happened. In th that that was my hypothesis is that where this is this is how this all took place, and it all just sort of follow that up to 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 lend evidence to it. I said, okay, so where was a place that 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 had a a well recorded culture that did that that didn't really have the connections or the major connections to the West? And when I when I looked, I, I came across China. And and for the longest time, you know, of course there were there was there was some connection going back and forth between between China uh, and, and Europe, um, but but is but it was not a major for a long time it was not a major uh, um, you know exchange of information, and and so for the longest time 
in China, this vast country, uh, they had they never got the you know they never got the memo that cannibalism was the worst thing you can do. And so there was culinary cannibalism in the 13th and 14th century, and and filial piety, where if you had a um, a sick relative, um, that that uh, one of the things that you could do as a, as a, a young member of the family was to was to, to cut off a piece of your uh, of your flesh and feed it to them, um, and tied into the idea of medicinal cannibalism that this might be able to help them survive. So and and there were a lot of cultures that that you know that. They never got the message that cannibalism was the worst thing that you could do, and and they incorporated it into their practices. And so once again, culture is king. It's 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 we who it's the individual cultures who determine what is right and what is wrong. Not just cannibalism, of course. I mean, it's a bit odd because Christianity seems to have some tentative relationship with cannibalism. I'm an atheist, but I went to Bible school as a kid. I'm from Eastern Europe. Um, and I always struggled with the bit where the sacramental bread and wine turns into Jesus's body and blood. And we have to eat them during mass, especially because yeah. the nuns told us that this actually happens. Um, yeah, well, I didn't. I kind of still don't understand why we have to eat Jesus. If, on the other hand, eating somebody is the worst thing that exists. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I went into that and, and, and that's where I, you know, when, when you write a book about cannibalism, you sort of expect that you're going to get some flack back about it. And and when it was the section that I wrote about um, a, a, about the host and, and the wine at, during communion uh, that got the most flack from, you know, from people associated with the Vatican, for example. Um, but, yeah. I, and, you know, in the old days, it, you know, I have a lot of a lot of my relatives are, 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 are Catholics and 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 I don't believe that any of them. Uh, consider that when they are taking communion on Sunday, that they are actually eating the body uh, of Jesus Christ and and drinking His blood. But it, you know, this is symbolic, and and they realize that. But back in the old days, there was no symbolism. There there were popes who went out there and said, "No, this is not symbolic. This is actually the transformation of Christ's body into this uh, into this communion wafer." Yeah, that sounds uh, familiar. Anybody, and anybody who stands against that is, you know, that's blasphemy. So and and things were things were a lot more difficult back then as well. If you were um, a, a Jew, for example, who was uh, convicted of, uh, of of abusing the host, then then you, you would you know quickly burn. Um, so yeah, it was that was a really interesting aspect, and and maybe the most controversial thing that I that I that I talked about among many uh, in this book. Can I ask what sort of pushback did you receive from from the Vatican? <laughs> it wasn't really from it, it wasn't directly from the Vatican. It was from people who were you know, who had been scholars that were uh, that that were associated um, tangentially with the Vatican who told me that uh, you know that that to consider this cannibalism is was uh, was ridiculous. <laughs> um, now, uh, despite our long standing kind of yeah cultural distaste for it people actually practiced a peculiar form of cannibalism in europe for a very long time up, up until very recently even could you tell us a bit more about that yeah this was one of the two big surprises that that that, that i got when i when i decided to write this book and started to look into it the first was how widespread it was across the animal kingdom so we, we talked about that but the other was that given this western taboo and how strong it was the fact that starting in the middle ages and going right up into the early 20th century body parts of every type were used medicinally so we're talking about blood we're talking about fat we're talking about flesh um, and and to 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 cure things like epilepsy or or bad skin or uh, it, it, and and it just went on and on and this really this was a huge surprise um, and and as I said this went right up into the 1900s in the Merck Index which is sort of the pharmacological encyclopedia mumia was listed as a as a, as having powdered mummy was listed as having medicinal value powdered and mummy. Powder yeah, this all came about because of a mistranslation. Um, this uh, the, there was an Arabic term that that, that is similar to the word mummy, um, and the Europeans who who came across that term for a while, the Arabs were, were um, had taken over uh, had taken over Egypt, and um, and and one of these translations 
it was mistranslated because in Arabic, they were talking about this sort of bitumen tarry substance that they were using to, um, to, uh, to, to uh, close wounds, for example. So uh, topically, kind of like, topically. Uh, like a bandage almost that would right. dry and, and close the wound. And the, and the Europeans mistranslated it and thought that they were talking about mummies. And so that mummies have medicinal value. So, so, so mummies were shipped to to Europe or stolen uh, and ground up and 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 sold as uh, as uh, as having medicinal value, and as I said, this went on for for you know a hundred years or so, right up into the beginning of the twentieth century. It was like the nineteen teens in the Merck Index. Here you had this uh, the this substance mumia. So what you could just walk into a pharmacy and say, I want some grounded mummy, I have a headache, and they would just give yeah. it to you in the 19th century. That was probably fake, or it was probably not real mummy. They would take some dead guy and dry him out and grind him up. But they would actually use bodies for that. Yes. Yep. And what did they think this is going to cure? What kind of diseases? Just a cure-all? or? Yeah, I, 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 I can't remember the specifics, but, but I think it was more or less, like you said, a general cure-all for, for you know, whatever ailed you. Okay. Instead of it was, you know, it was more or less along the lines of instead of take two aspirin and call me in the morning, it was, you know, pop this um, mumia, probably made into an elixir uh, and then, and then uh, drank. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Um, all right. Well, this, I, yeah. Medicinal metabolism still survives today in, in, you know, people who think that consuming their placentas is, it does, uh, does some good. And I had some experiences with that. Right. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you described that in the book that you actually partook in that form of cannibalism a little bit. Could you, could you talk about yeah. that as well? Cause that's yeah. fascinating. Is that still going on this trend by the way? Yeah. And uh, it's not widespread and it's, it's, it's basically a form of alternative medicine. So you might find it in practitioners of, of alternative medicine, mostly in the United States. It's not found very uh, ma many other places started out as a sort of late hippie thing, late seventies, not as a, not a, more as a, a sort of communal. Um, we're talking about the placenta. Let's clear that up here, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, mostly fetal tissue, partially maternal tissue and it's uh, it's really the uh, it's really sort of the um the the interface between the developing fetus and the mother and so the blood goes through the, the, the and is filtered by the mother's blood is it goes through and is filtered by the placenta before it enters the uh, the baby uh, so so you can think of it as that and, but it is delivered with the you know after the this is after birth this is what we're talking about here and some women believe that um that 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 consuming the placenta after after giving birth restores the hormones that are lost when the placenta is uh, you know is del is delivered um and so things like curing the baby blues the depression that sometimes follows uh, giving birth uh, these were the uh, this was the reasoning be behind uh consuming your, your placenta and uh, it is not very widespread. Um, and, um, and so um, I had finished writing the, pretty much finished writing the book. And I, and I, I recently retired, took an early retirement from, from teaching. But I was probably about 10 days away from starting a semester. And I had come across this story about, uh, about placentophagy. And, and made a couple of phone calls to talk to researchers who, who might know about it. And one of them hooked me up with a, with a woman who lived in um, uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, who, who did this for a living. She went to the hospital, she collected the placenta, and then she would bring it home and, and, and you know, she would do things like dry it out and make powder out of it. Or, you know, if you wanted to have it fresh, she would make a, you know, she would make a, 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 a Slurpee out of it and you can <laughs> drink it. Um, and so there were all sorts of ways that she would prepare this thing. So I'm talking to her on the phone for not like a half an hour. And she's telling me about her clients and how interesting this was. And, and at the end of the conversation, she goes, well, you know, it's too bad you can't come down here because you could eat my placenta. And I, and I went, well, and she said, yeah, my, I just gave birth, you know, a month or so ago. And, and I, I've got one in the, 
in the in the freezer. My husband is a is a, is a chef. He can prepare it for you any way you want it. You can make a taco out of it. You can make you, you can have it asabuco style. However you want it, you can have it. And I and I, I'm just like amazed. I'm sitting there going, thinking to myself, did this woman just invite me down to Dallas, Texas, which I've never been there before, uh, to eat her placenta? And 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 I'm then I started to think. You know, if it's 10 years from now, I've written a book about cannibalism and talked about this and and I had the chance to go down there and do this and I didn't do it, That then I'd be kicking myself in the behind. I know it. So I told my wife about it and she was like, yeah, go. <laughs> so 10 minutes later, I had bought tickets, flew down there through a hellacious storm that had knocked out the power uh, to the to, to this to this area. And and I'm I'm, I'm in the hotel that night and. I go out to eat and there's a really, really weird vibe. Um, and, and, and it had to do with the fact that, that there was, you know, this, there was first instances of, of, of some serious illness that had come in from Africa and, and, and people were really freaked out about it. So everybody's like all wired and on edge. I get a phone call from her and she says, you know, well, our, our babysitter canceled on us. We were going to drop off our little angels, but I got to tell you that my, that my 10 homeschooled kids will be there when you come over tomorrow morning. So uh, the next day, um, I, I head over to her house and I make a stop at the liquor store. And I, I'm thinking to myself, OK, well, uh, I got to bring a bottle of wine for this. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, well, uh, I want to find the most Texas looking salesperson that I can find down there, which is not difficult as a lady with cowboy boots, the whole nine yards. And I said, well, you know, I've got a really interesting pairing for you today. And, you know, and I told her what I was and she literally ran away from me. So I so I grabbed the bottle of Italian red and uh, and I made my way over to her house and uh, and and got greeted by this like, wave of 10 kids who were all over me. You know, they'd never seen an iPhone before. They, it, you know, this is back a couple of years ago. They're, oh, you, can I hold your iPhone and can I, are you going to eat my mother's placenta? <laughs> so. So it turned out to be this incredibly incredible experience. I interviewed her, and 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 she pretty much admitted that that what you, she was dealing with was the placebo effect. She was very intelligent and and recognized that there were no real scientific papers out there that 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 showed that that, that consuming your placenta did very much of anything, especially if you cooked it. And you're thinking in terms of if, if you're going to replenish your hormones by eating a placenta, you know hormones are a type of protein. And if you take this and cook it, you're now have denatured this protein. Okay. You do this with albumin in an egg. It's not the same thing when you cook it uh, as it is in the egg. And, and she recognized that, but, but, but as she did say, and, and, and we've got to agree with it is that, it, you know, the placebo effect is very strong. So if you think you're getting a benefit out of it, many times you do. Um, so after the interview was over, her husband, comes out and he's got like a, a complete chef's uniform on. He's got the hat, the whole thing. And he, and he steams up these vegetables and uh, first cooks some vegetables and, you know, sweats them. And he says, I, these vegetables are organic. And I'm like, I just remember saying, him, thank God, because there's no chance that I'm eating your wife's placenta unless the vegetables are organic. So we, so he cooks this up. He, and, and finally he, in the, in the freezer, they defrost these little bits of, of her placenta. It really wasn't that much. It was, you know, maybe a couple of tablespoons. What does that look it. like, by the way? It looks like, it, it, I mean, it, it, it looks like organ meat. If you've ever like chopped up a kidney or like a, liver or you know, kind of like that. Okay. Um, um, so he cooks it up and, uh, and I, you know, I, I ate it and, and it was delicious. It was, you know, you added the wine to it and it, you know, it's just like anything else. It's how you cook it and what part of the, of the body, whether it's a cow or a human or, you know, or, or a pig or a chicken, it depends on what part you're eating and what it tastes like. And this tasted to me like, uh, you know, it, it was a bit unique. And, and back when I was in college, we had, we were, all of us, we were all broken on Sundays. We used to watch football and we used to get chicken gizzards and, and, and fry them up with, uh, you know, with garlic and olive oil. And, and the taste reminded me of, of a chicken gizzard. But it had mm -hmm. the it was it had the consistency it was very tender it tasted more, it had the consistency of veal, so that's what it tasted like uh, and 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 so yeah if I'd have written you know I've written three novels and 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 if you'd have let me just 
write this, make this entire trip up. It could not have been any weirder than it was. And, and, and she was wonderful and her, and her kids were wonderful and her, and her husband was really cool. And, you know, they, they, they were very poor. And I, I just remember for, for a number of Christmases after that, just sending them boxes of, of, of gifts and things like that for her kids. And it, it, you know, I, I went in there all snarky thinking, you know, um, 10 kids is going to be like the old woman in the, in, who lived in the shoe. And, and I just felt like such an idiot because she was such a nice person and, 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 and so kind and treated me so well. And, um, you know, it was a very memorable experience. I would never do it again. Uh, did did you feel different after eating the placenta? No. No, Were you like, no. now I'm officially a cannibal? No, never thought, <laughs> never thought that at all. I just thought, you know, I was doing it for the, for the sake of the book. I, right. I don't, con- I, I don't, you know, this, this is not something that I think makes any sense, especially since I could have, if she'd yeah. have been ill, I might've gotten, you know, I might've gotten sick. And so that was a chance that I took. And and so I do tell people that I, I don't believe that there are, that there are any benefits whatsoever, but there are definitely some, 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 uh, some possible problems that, that, that might develop from, from doing that. So it, it's not something that I recommend. All right. So this placebo effect didn't work on you. No, I, 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 I had, I hadn't had, um, um, morning sickness or, uh, or that sort of thing in, in, in years. <laughs> okay. Um, just to make it clear at this point is any form of chewing or ingesting any part of, you know, the bo- of human body in any form, is that considered cannibalism? Because for yeah. example, I'm a nervous wreck. I bite my yeah. fingernails all the time. So am I might yeah. technically speaking as some sort of a self sado cannibal or something. There are gray areas in the, in in cannibalism. Whether if you're if you're if you're kissing somebody and you're swapping spit with them, is that cannibalism? And you know, so so there are also if you bite your fingernails, that sort of thing. Um, so there are certainly gray areas where you could make. I mean, you could say that it's cannibalism, but but it, that's really not what we're talking about here. When when I I define cannibalism as consuming all or part of another individual of the same species or, or, or a substantial part of that, of, of that, of that individual. Okay. That's cannibalism to me. And, and so for example, I work at the museum of natural history. One of my colleagues, um, when we talked about cannibalism in, in, in dinosaurs, uh, Mark Norell, a, a curator there, and I got into a discussion and he had said that when he was in, in Africa, he saw a cannibal, uh, he's, excuse me, he saw a, a camel, uh, eating a, another camel that was dead. And and he said he didn't consider that cannibalism. He considered it scavenging. And I said, well, I consider it cannibalism because it's the, 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 the camel is eating another camel. If it had been eating a dead pig, then I wouldn't consider it cannibalism. So there, in, in, you know, like I said, there are gray areas here and there's some discussion about what is and what isn't. Okay. I recently went to, to McDonald's uh, here in, in Berlin and I saw a pigeon eating some chicken nuggets that somebody left over. It just seemed some kind of wrong, but I don't know. That's different species though. Yeah, that's anyway. not cannibals. Okay. If it was I have another was, tricky. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. If the if the pigeon had been eating pigeon McNuggets, then it would <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I have another trick one for you. I'm a massive hip hop fan. And when the rapper Tupac got shot and killed, there was a rumor floating around that was apparently confirmed later that members of his crew, the outlaws, rolled some of his ashes in a joint and smoked them. There's also the story about Keith, Keith Richards snorting some of his father's ashes from the table. Would these cases yeah. be considered cannibalism or not really? Well, I mean, I, I, I looked into, the, I'd, I'd never heard the Tupac story, so I can't really yeah. comment on that. If they rolled his ashes and, 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 and what, smoked it? Yeah, uh, I'm not really consuming it. And, and by the same token, what um, what happened, what I had read happened with with Keith is that his his father, his beloved father had been uh, cremated and, and and in transferring his ashes from from one place to another, some of them fell onto the onto the uh, onto the table. And, and he, he just sort of wiped them up with with his finger and just sniffed them in. Um, and and I thought it was kind of a. a the way he described it, I thought was extremely touching. And, and I don't think he was being an idiot. I, I just think he was, that was a bit of respect that he was paying to his dad. Uh, but I don't consider either one of those to be cannibalism. If, mm. you know, if he, if he'd have, if he'd have huffed down the, uh, 
the, the ashes or they they'd consume them consume two packs ashes uh, then then i guess you might consider it cannibalism as i said there's a lot of there's a lot of gray, gray areas. areas yeah you describe a lot of cases of survival cannibalism where people have nothing else to eat but but um the bodies of their comrades or um other humans by the way how much nutrition do you get from eating a human why are these these people who resort to survival cannibalism or who have to always so gaunt and skinny when they find them you would be i would be thinking that you know you would get some proper nutrition out of that yeah that 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 look that you see is the same look when you see starved children and and basically what has happened is that you have you're starved to the point where your body is literally cannibalizing itself it your your protein is being broken down um, so that uh, uh, as a nutritional source by your own body. And that's why you have this sort of like sunken appearance uh, that that people who are, uh, you know, uber starved have. Um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that the human body in these conditions are, is would, would be as as nutritious as 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 any other mammal that you might consume. Um, so and so you're you're eating muscle first probably uh and then you're going for uh and and then you're eating um organs like uh, like the liver and, and and heart and there's nutrition there it's not going to you know uh, we're, we're not talking about you know getting super healthy for a, a diet of consuming human flesh but but it is you know it's mammal flesh so there, there there's certainly nu nutrition there All right. As we touched on it before, there were many cases of Western European colonizers designating local populations as cannibals. So they had a convenient reason to subjugate them. Right. Most of the time, these were either rumors or, you know, things they heard, inventions. There was hardly any proof for. Well, for I mean, there, there could have been ritual cannibalism as well. Yeah. In, OK. In some of these instances. Right. Yeah. So on this note, we do know for sure that some tribes, I, uh, tribes like you mentioned in, in Guinea, for example, New Guinea, did practice a form of ritual funerary cannibalism, right? We know that because also because a, a horrible disease began spreading among, amongst these tribes. Kuru, I think it was called, a disease mm -hmm. that literally produces holes in, in the brain tissue. Could That's you... very reminiscent of Alzheimer's. I think it's on the same spectrum okay. as, uh, as Alzheimer's disease. And the fact that it... it, it It causes um, severe progressive damage to the to to the brain. So, if we discard our kind of social or cu cultural reservations, could we consider kuru this disease as the ultimate proof that cannibalism is necessarily a bad practice, or are things not so simple? <sighs> I mean, I, I, I think that. I think that Kuru is is certainly a danger when you're. I mean, I mean, I just there was this Facebook thing the other day that was like, what one, what would you never eat? And I just put brains down there because whether you're talking about humans or or you're talking about deer, for example, you're getting, you know, there is the possibility of getting this type of spongiform encephalopathy. It is a, uh, it is a a disease that is it depends on who you talk to is either caused by uh, by by these self-replicating proteins, which have never been seen called prions, or it's caused by a, a, a something that's been termed a slow virus. And, and, and I have really been on the fence about which of these I, I, I believe, because there are some serious experts on both sides. But, it, but in any event, that those diseases come about, whether you are getting mad cow disease or yeah. whether you are whether you're dealing with kuru, um, uh, come about because of eating neural tissue, spinal cord and brain uh, and uh, of an infected individual. And so um, this was a great fear back when, when, back when uh, slaughterhouse, when the rules that were, were being used to, to deal with animals in slaughterhouses and how they were fed Uh, changed uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a great fear that uh, that people were going to come down with with mad cow disease because they were literally um, uh, chopping up um, cows that had died and feeding them to other cows. And and there were many instances of of, of mad cow disease and 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 some of them got into people. 
and 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 young people, for example, died tragically. Um, so so that's one, you know, that's one aspect of this as as, as a negative from from cannibalism. And by the same token, the anthropologists who went into New Guinea uh, in the 1950s found to their horror that approximately one percent of this uh, of this indigenous group, the the, the four. Were, were were dying from this terrible wasting disease, uh, and they they two Nobel prizes were won by the researchers who did that work to figure out that it was it, it, that that it stemmed from the fact that that um, that women and and children after people had passed away would consume parts of the deceased. The, the researchers wondered why aren't men getting this disease? So there was this whole, you know, they thought it might have been genetic, and then, you know, was but but then children of both sexes were 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 getting this, um, and what they found out was that that it was because the the women and the children were consuming the the body parts, but but the men, the adult men, weren't, um, and that it was from something very similar to to mad cow disease. You had this the either a prion or a or a, or a virus. That that was found in the in an infected uh, victim's nervous system, and if you consumed it, that you would pass it on, and it didn't matter if you cooked it or not. Uh, you weren't you weren't destroying it. So yeah, I, it, it's something that would scare me if if there if there became widespread cannibalism anywhere. Uh, that that would certainly be something you'd have to you would have to uh, you would have to consider is is uh, is is the health hazards of, um, of of this horrible incurable disease so does that come only from consuming brain tissue or other body parts as well from what i understand the highest concentration of this is found in uh in in the brain and spinal cord and nerve nerves so yeah all right um there's also the example i mean the example the hypothesis that that was a contributing factor for the demise of the neanderthals Right. Mm, yeah. yeah, that was a model that someone put together, uh, and 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 I I thought it was a really interesting model. But there's there's absolutely no proof. You know, he just said there's proof that there was cannibalism that took place. There's proof that Kuru kills will kill you. So that might have, might have been a contributing factor to the demise of the Neanderthals. There's there's no solid evidence. It was a, a it was sort of a mathematical model that a researcher put together. I thought it was interesting, but 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 I mean I do spell it out as as a, as as a model not nothing more this it's not like they found um kuru, they, they found evidence of kuru in the fossil record I, I, they haven't mm. i recently hosted a famous anthropologist um professor stringer on the podcast and we talked about this as well and he said that's mm -hmm. a he, he said that's a very reasonable hypothesis and that he thinks that's it's right. very possible mm -hmm. anyway yeah all right. Oh, wow. Time is passing. Um, right. These days, it seems that in, in pop culture, cannibalism is all the rage, right? We have the TV show Hannibal with Matt Mikkelsen. I loved it. I love that guy. Uh, we got the sexy French film Raw. Then there was the film Fresh. And now we have Bones and All with Timothy Chalamet. It seems like the whole incest business that Game of Thrones kind of brought in is out and cannibalism is in. Why do you think that is? Uh, luckily for me, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> good timing. The, the, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, to me, it reminds me of, of, of the, of the idea of vampirism. There's something kind of, kind of, well, with vampirism, it's something like sexy about it. And, and, and with cannibalism, it's, it, it's certainly not sexy, but, but it is, there is food plus, Number one taboo equals fascination. Now, now, if, if so, if you can run that through a filter of sort of fictionalization, then it becomes acceptable. Then you can watch it if you know that it's fiction, um, and 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 it is. You know, I, I guess people are stimulated by that. You know, we're 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 into violence and gore on, especially if it's. You know, since the nineteen late nineteen sixties, when Bonnie and Clyde and the Wild Bunch came out, then uh, you know, then people were getting blown apart on the screen. You know, then there was this acceptance of uh, there was more acceptance of gore than than anybody had ever seen before in, in the media, um, and and so I think we've become numb to it. And 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 uh, and I and as I said, I think if 
you know, we're all disgusted if we hear about criminal cannibalism. But if you are watching a movie where you know it's, you know, this is fictional, um, then it becomes, th then you're fascinated by it because it's this combination of, of food um, and, uh, and which has always had a tie into cannibalism because it's like, you know, if, if, if you think about, uh, about other cultures, they're sometimes sort of ostracized because of what they eat. Um, for example, when I was a kid that, you know, I heard the slang term for French, it was frogs. That's because they supposedly ate frogs legs. I didn't know if that was true or not. So, so you're, you're defined by what you eat. And, and so there has always been this sort of fascination with, uh, with, with, with food and, 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 you know, so you tie that into this taboo that we have. And, and I think you've got, you've got all this interest right now. I see you wearing the t-shirt depicting Nosferatu. Uh, you think that vamp vampires and vampirism was once a safer way to talk about cannibalism? <laughs> oh gosh, uh, I, I you know I think vampirism is a form of cannibalism, but um, okay, you know, I, I don't really tie the two together very much. We're almost at the end. No, we are at the end, which means I have to ask you something a bit trashy because the name of this podcast is Euro Trash. You alluded to it already, but it seems that these these days on screen the cannibals are getting sexier and sexier over time, right? We had Anthony Hopkins, kind of smart, yeah. sophisticated, but oh, yeah. he was a bit older, like Dra more like Dracula or something. Like, Then we got Mats Mikkelsen, who was already kind of like sexy. He was an excellent chef also, uh, extremely snazzy. And now we have Timothy Chalamet, the ultimate heartthrob cannibal. Is there any sort of connection between cannibalism and sex? Oh, well, look, so now you have food plus the taboo, and then you have this really handsome guy. So that, that I mean, that, this is, and, 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 you know, bones and all flopped badly. You know, I, I, oh, really? Because here everybody's talking about it. They're, they're like, yeah. you have to go see that movie. I didn't no, check the box office, though. That, that there was this huge lead up to it in the States, and I'd been interviewed a number of times about it. And then when the movie finally hit, it bombed, it, you know, it, 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 it didn't do well at all. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, once again, I, I, you, you just go back to these, to the attraction to cannibalism and then add the fact that let's see, should we have the cannibalism be this kind of like ugly old guy? Uh, and I'm not talking about Anthony Hopkins, who I don't consider to be an ugly old guy, <laughs> but, um, uh, let's put this sexy guy in here. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a much better idea. I, I just think that's what you're dealing with here. What's next though. We had incest cannibalism. Where can we go next in pop culture and movies? Ugh, is there anything know. left? <laughs> What's the last boundary? Yeah, I want to write about it if it's uh, if it's out there. I, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what the what the next thing that I'm writing about is. I, the, after cannibalism, that I wrote a book about the natural history of the heart, and I just finished one on the evolution of teeth and the natural history of teeth. But um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of uh, and and get back into some uh, into some weirdness. But I but the, there are, there's nothing that that strikes me right now as being quite as as interesting and multifaceted as cannibalism was you know which is why the you know a, after after bite my book on teeth comes out I, I think the next thing that'll come out is a children's version of the cannibalism book which is now in discussion <laughs> with, uh, uh, with my publisher Algonquin so uh, I you know uh, there's nothing that comes to mind that that is equivalent to that and and something that can be approached not from a you know, I tried to stay away from the real sensational aspects of cannibalism because there have been a lot of what I consider to be junk out there. Oh, like you know, just like Jeffrey Dahmer all the time and all of this stuff oh, yeah. and, and yeah, gains. Just, and, yeah, and I, and I really wanted to stay away from that when I wrote this book because, I, for, for one, I didn't want. I wanted to look at this. I wanted to look at cannibalism through the eyes of a zoologist, a scientist, and I, but I didn't want to lay on the. I'm also an educator. I didn't want to lay on the, the heavy terminology and show off how much science I knew. I wanted to explain things, and I, I, I just thought that um, that 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 was a that was a um, that was an approach that had never been taken before with this topic, cannibalism. Uh, be, on the other side, on the opposite side of the spectrum from the sensational stuff, uh, was were the academic works that, that that you would only read if you were a scientist who was working on this species who cannibalized for whatever the reason happened to be. So there was this opening that I just walked right through and when I wrote this book. And I, I sort of did the same thing for 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 blood feeding and and and, and vampirism. But yeah, I'm looking for the next topic um to do that with. Um and 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 I haven't 
quite come up with. Well, I hope you do, because this book was absolutely fantastic. I really recommend it to everybody. Uh, Where can people follow follow your work? Um, Let's see, Uh, BillShot.com. So I have a website and then you can just look me up uh, on uh, on Facebook. It's BillShot author. Uh, I'm also on Goodreads, BillShot author. Uh, all over Amazon. The book is available wherever you want in every format. All of my books are, you know, available uh, in, in in any format that, that that you prefer. Which and and I'm I'm just thrilled about that. So, um, so, so I, I hope you guys are and your hope your readers are, are are interested enough to to sort of follow up with it and get back to me. You can certainly contact me through my website and and happy to chat with with uh, with readers. All right. Do you have any social media accounts? Um, well, like a Twitter account. Yeah. 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 You have to. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they yeah, can, yeah. people can find it on your website as yeah. well, probably. Right. Bullshot author. So, it, I mean, website is B I L L S C H U T T.com. It's pretty easy to remember. Awesome. Uh, professor shot. Thank you so much for taking the time. This was fantastic. You're very welcome. Nice to be here. Zavon. Hi, thanks for watching. Just want to give a quick shout out to my amazing patron, uh, Thea Dejman Taichi. You're awesome. Thank you so much. If you want to support Eurotrash, you can do that on Patreon. You'll find the link below. Uh, yeah. Oh, and please hit subscribe. Thanks.